It's a real privilege to follow Aideen's uh, inspirational lecture. Thank you very much for that. And although uh, I will be talking about many of the issues that she, uh, she has identified and coming at it from uh, a somewhat different perspective in some cases, I think there's an enormous uh, complementarity between what she has just said and the work that's underway in relation to higher education. Uh, development, I won't call it reform, um, but development and growth. And in her kind introduction, Mary Liz alluded to the fact that I have been uh, for quite some time now a, se a senior policymaker in a range of departments, um, in, including the Thetics Department, Department of Health, Department of Children, and most recently the Department of Education and Skills, where I have the higher education brief. And I thought it was useful in in, in co contemplating the presentation this morning uh, in the context of the theme of the conference to maybe just say a little bit about the perspective of the policymaker. And uh, so what does a policymaker do? Well, it varies from day to day and minute to minute, I can tell you, but there are some constants. A senior policymaker will always work in a very complex ecosystem, by which I mean uh, in a democracy, uh, the, the inputs, uh, the pieces that are brought to bear by, by that democracy on the political system, on public administration, on key stakeholders, on old and new institutions. It's a very, very complex area uh, in which to work. And the policymaker tends to find himself or herself at the center of a lot of competing demands. So there are are, in addition to the challenges which uh, the conference is posing today, sorry now, I'm, yeah, the, the question of how equal, there are many other uh, challenges confronting us collectively uh, in the room today. There's the challenge of deciding what to do. There's the challenge of deciding uh, on our priorities. There's the challenge of allocating resources to those choices. There's the challenge of connections, and there's the challenge of implementation. And it's really the challenge of implementation that I want to focus on in my presentation this morning. Because when I came to this portfolio, uh, just over a year ago now, pushing on to a year and a half, I was very interested in the connections between education, employment, uh, uh, equality. Those of you who've worked with me in the past will know this. And I was particularly interested in thinking through what our policy on access to higher education is and how it can make a contribution to developing that debate and making real change in people's lives. But being the practical and pragmatic uh, policymaker that I am, of course, I started with the, for me, the obvious questions. What is it we want to do in this area? What do we want to achieve? And how uh, do we go about achieving it? So in addition to understanding how equal uh, and what are the issues around equality in relation to higher education. For me, um, there is the next set of questions about what are we trying to do and what do we need to do to achieve those. So I, have, um, I won't go through this slide in detail, but to pick up on a point that Aideen made around the strong interdependence of social and economic objectives, I mean, that is the reality. I mean, there are lots of debates around which is chicken and which is egg. But in my view, they're completely interdependent, that our, our well-being as a society uh, and uh, as an economy and the things we do to support those are completely interrelated. So when I ask the question on access, what do we want to achieve? Uh, one of my colleagues eventually said, I think he said after much reflection, that the Bologna process definition which, as you know, deals with 47 different European countries and higher education system. It's, he said he believed it sums up the social dimension policy uh, very succinctly. And this is the definition that is at the heart of a lot of what we're doing on access and will be doing over the next trial. And I think it's probably worth just recounting that. 
So we share the societal aspiration that the student body entering, participating in, and completing higher education at all levels should reflect the diversity of our populations. Now, there may be debate, I don't know if there will be debate about whether that's an appropriate definition, but it is um, a policy, uh, the government policy in this area, and it's the foundation for the, the various pieces of work on access as we take them forward. So, what are, uh, what are the key challenges? Well, we've rehearsed some of them already this morning. We know that despite the fact that we have a higher education attainment in our younger age cohorts, in fact, as you know, it's among the highest in the EU, we know that we still have a significant challenge from socio some socioeconomic ethnic ability and age cohorts, and that they are against that definition uh, underrepresented in higher education. Professor Clancy's work, and I had the pleasure of meeting him earlier on, provides a stark indication of the differences between socioeconomic groups uh, at the entry point to higher education. And that work, and, and again, it's the policymaker in me and the focus on evidence. I am looking forward to the outcomes of the, the work that the HEA is now undertaking to update this important data, because I think that will be another foundation stone for building the policy in the years to come. And I know that that, that work is underway and hopefully will be completed shortly. People have talked a little bit uh, in, in the various uh, uh, presentations about transitions, and I've been very involved in the work that some of you will, will know about on the transition from uh, second level to higher education. And it's the first time in the education family that all of the education uh, agencies have come together, HEA, NCCA, the State Exams Commission, the IUA, the IOTI, the department, and QQI. I think I've got them all, I hope I have anyway. Um, and that's a really big step in education because traditionally we've dealt, we've, we've put everything into silos. So there's a huge challenge, challenge in policy terms in bringing together all the main actors around a powerful agenda item. And I think, and I was talking to Emer earlier on about this, I think there's no doubt that this transitions agenda is such a, is such a powerful uh, lever of change because it, it makes us, it forces us to look at the interdependencies between the various parts of the education system. And again, repeating something that somebody said earlier, I completely agree that uh, a whole of education approach, right from early childhood education, which I was very involved in, in the Office of the Minister for, Ch for Children, right onwards through lifelong learning, is central to the development of a coherent policy approach in this area. But that's a very big ask. We haven't managed to achieve that. Um, maybe stating it, and stating it as, as uh, strongly as I've just stated it, stated it, will help us to think about how we go about this. But it is like, to be honest, like mobilising um, a whole set of battalions in an army who traditionally don't talk to each other and making them into um, a, a, a cohesive force. So there's quite a challenge involved in that simple statement. A moment, I won't take long on this, just to, again, the practicality of my questions to my colleagues are, well, what are our, what are we doing um, on access at the moment? What are our key interventions? What resources are we, are we already putting into this agenda? And I'm talking here not just of um, money, but probably more critically, I think, uh, the people who are involved in this agenda right through the system. So, um, I, I don't need to spend time on this, you're more familiar with it than I am, but clearly interventions like Here and There have a particular focus and have been, I think, um, been making a very large contribution to this agenda. The Student Grant Scheme uh, is, is another aspect of, uh, of policy in this area, and it's designed to directly meet the costs associated with higher uh, educa education. Then higher education institutions, and again, you'll be more familiar with this than I am, uh, have quite a lot of activity in engaging directly in outreach initiatives involving schools and communities in disadvantaged areas. And I'm guessing from, um, particularly from Aideen's presentation, that that's going to be a key part of what we need to lock into place as we move forward. And this last one is, I think, really, really central, but it's at a very early stage of development. 
it is really important for institutions, both individually and in clusters, to start talking about developing alternative pathways, more flexible provision and inclusive approaches to teaching and learning. And I know there's a lot going on in that, in that way. And I know that there are big policy challenges in there as well. So in terms of trying to move along that agenda, I think uh, we're just at the starting point of the discussion. So I'm full of questions. Don't uh, so, more questions. So, from, from the policymakers' perspective, there are, there are a number of key questions. How do we ensure a coherent approach to driving equity of access across the system? So, the first thing is, do we have a system or do we have a set of individual institutions? So that's a very big question. Second question is, how do we support those working in the area of access in prioritizing this important policy objective? And the third question, which I think is a very big question for this conference, is how do we ensure that we learn um, that what we learn and what demonstrably works is reflected in policy? So you have this struggle between pockets of really good practice, but we're less developed in terms of the infrastructure to um, share that knowledge and put it into operation uh, at, 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 a, at a, um, a more general level. So I'm nearly at the little boxes now. I'm coming to the performance framework for higher education. Um, but I do want to just say a few words before I get to them. I think, um, as a number of speakers have said, certainly as the Minister said, we are in the process of a really interesting and exciting uh, development of uh, higher education. The National Strategy for Higher Education, as you know, recommended the implementation of a steering and performance-based framework for the system governance of higher education. And I actually have the privilege of being a member of uh, what's commonly known as the Hunt Group, so I'm familiar with the discussions and with the report which was produced. Now, this is where I think it gets interesting and where sort of, I suppose, the kind of work we're doing on the policy making meets some of the points that, that Aidan was making, coming from a, a, a different but complementary direction. So the, the framework provides for national policies to be articulated and to be translated into a number of key system objectives for the short to medium term. Now we struggled a bit then, well, okay, so if we set out um, national priorities, how will we know we are, in, in what direction are we moving? Are we achieving them? Are we not achieving them? How do we establish what the gaps are? So we, um, we, do, we have set out a set of high-level system indicators and international benchmarks, and I'll show you very quickly an example of that. There's a key role, of course, for the HEA, as you know, in all of this work, uh, and one of the tasks is to report back to the minister on system performance and providing contextual analysis for that. And therein, I think, may, may lie the solution to some of, some of the struggles we're having. And obviously, we have committed to keeping the indicators under review. So why have we a system indicator framework? Well, again, you can see it there on the screen, but we believe that it is really important, particularly in, a, in, a, in such an important area as higher education, that we have clarity, accountability, visibility uh, on, on what's going on. On the development of the system, and there will be choices, there are already choices being made in how the system de develops, so we need, to, uh, we need to understand the system, we need to understand what th where its strengths are and what structure and other deficits exist, and we need to have a plan and a, an approach to addressing those issues. And on performance, just a, a, another, if, if you like, angle almost on performance uh, in this context, it's really important that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Uh, and part of the objective is to allow institutions to identify their strategic niche and mission. And that will be set out in the performance compact with the HEA. So, where now, as you know, um, the government have agreed the national priorities that be conveyed to the HEA and published earlier this year. They include a set of high-level system indicators uh, as well as descriptive indicators, and I'll come back to that in a minute. They were based uh, not just on uh, gazing into our own hearts, but on a, a consultation with the Higher Education uh, Authority, with our colleagues in the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation for FOSS and QQI. And the next step which is underway is for the HEA 
to um, enter the process in relation to the performance compacts, and I know that's, that's underway. And another piece of this jigsaw, which I think is important, but again is at an earlier stage, is um, the regional focus. In Ireland, we don't have a, a very strong tradition of delivering uh, services regionally, but in higher education, it makes sense, I think, um, to have uh, regional clusters in terms of students and pathways and provision. So we have... Um, made provision for that and we are in the process of working that through and you won't be able to read this in, uh, on, the, on the screen but it's available on our website certainly it's a sort of a systems uh, a systems diagram um, and in the blue or in the darker blue the, it's about establishing the priorities for the system and in the, the sort of the lighter blue or the green we we want to have some sense on a regular basis of how the system is reporting. Now, this isn't an easy one. You know, it's going to throw up all sorts of issues. But we need to have, in terms of what the, the priorities of the government has set and the investment that has been put in, there needs to be a systematic uh, view of, um, of uh, system performance. And again, this may help us if we use it well. So I won't go through this, but just to again say, in terms of the, that these are the national priorities which this government has set out for itself. And these are the systems uh, objectives. We've tried to design out complexity a bit, whether that's possible or not, I don't know. But you'll see the second one there at the top um, is to promote access for disadvantaged groups and improve pathways from second level FE and other routes. So there's no stronger articulation of government policy in relation to access for disadvantaged groups into higher education than in this document. And I suppose the challenge for us is to, um, is to see that as an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to align and mobilize the system. They're, they're the boxes, but I, in, in defense of the boxes, uh, and I have, I have a lot of sympathy with with the view that, you know, boxes encourage box ticking. I really, I really accept that. But we've just done three sets of boxes. We've set, out, um, we've set out what we believe the high level indicators are, how we will monitor them, and where we'll get the information. It's kind of sensible, I think. Um, and, and if we're creative about it, and we don't allow it to sink into box ticking, it's a tremendous um, opportunity for the Irish higher education system to actually tell its story in a way that I think it hasn't been particularly good at, if I could put that challenge back out, uh, over, the last, over the last while. We also set out, in addition to that framework, again, asking the practical question, well, how are we going to deliver this? You know, what are, what are the tools, what are the levers? So within the document, we clearly uh, have um, identified the things we're going to put effort into over the next while to help us with this agenda. So clearly the access plan from 2014 is, I th I'm not sure if it's the flagship, I don't know if that's the right term, but it's clearly the major vehicle for thinking through a lot of the, the, the key issues that we've been discussing uh, this morning already. Um, clearly need to take a look, a lens of access across the institutions. So it'll be really interest, interesting to see how this plays out. So instead of having an individual institution access plan kind of standing on its own, we should, at least theoretically, but I'm hoping in practice as well, be able to develop an overall, a macro view of system access plans uh, against the objectives. People have spoken about the need, uh, with which I entirely agree, to have a much greater connection between FE and HE. It is a really big agenda, but it's a difficult one. So we need to start putting the building blocks in place for that. As, as we do also in relation to the development of alternative entry routes into higher education. And QQI, I think, have a particularly important role here uh, in monitoring the implementation of national policies and procedures relating to access, transfer, and progression plans. So again, another important player um, uh, in, the overall, in the overall jigsaw. So uh, 
conscious of time. What's the implementing framework? What's the sort of time scale? Because this is quite immediate. Um, I know that the HA have um, received the draft three or compacts and are in the process of considering them, discussing them, and giving feedback to institutions by the middle of the month. Um, and moving then on into January 2014, uh, agreeing the institutional KPIs and performance compacts and submitting a, a first overall system report to the Minister in 2014. That's a really interesting, I think, and exciting development. There will more groans in the room, I fear, be a move towards performance funding, but we can either use it well or we can not use it well. I think, it, again, it gives us it gives us something that we don't have at the moment, and we probably need to have a, a further discussion on it. And uh, a new reporting structure is going into place between ourselves in the department and the HEA uh, based on an MOU service level agreement. So quite a change in the architecture. But what will actually change? Well, the theory at least is that every institution will have clear objectives for the various pieces of um, of their work um, and clearly quality teaching and learning is a key part of the access uh, agenda that's clear from the discussions already this morning and the role of the national forum which Sarah Moore is chairing I think will be very important uh, in this in this area um, we have a system for art articulating the priorities the pieces that are in place to achieve those priorities and make an assessment through the performance compacts. And as I said earlier, the regional compacts uh, also gives us uh, opportunities, but very much at an earlier stage at the moment. Um, and then the system performance reports will, will give us a sense of what's happening within the system. But again, in terms of this conference, I suppose I wanted to say that it is really important that there is a substantial access input into the institutional performance compacts because you know Aideen is right what gets measured gets done so there has to be a strong access piece into the compacts uh, I think um, um, for that piece of uh, your work to be reflected in in the in the uh, in the work as, uh, over the next number of years so going national and I'm almost at the end of, of the presentation I've been talking a lot there about um, what happens in individual institutions. One of the things we have been thinking about and talking about is, as I said, is how we take the good practice that's going on in a range of places uh, and we make it national. And there has been an increasing amount of public discourse, of, um, most, most recently in the, the Irish Times, it has to be said, about how well Ireland performs at community level, but less less so as a society at national level. There's a really interesting uh, set of articles about that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we know, uh, when we think about this, that the individual institutions and programmes in higher education have made real impacts locally. So that's one of the pieces that works for Ireland. So question, how do we ensure that this learning and energy translates into national level to inform policy on access? So rightly or wrongly, we believe that the performance framework provides a vehicle for this and that the input into the performance compacts and access will be reflected in the performance reports. And we're hoping, more than hoping, we believe strongly that this will help us to ensure that access becomes a more transversal priority at institutional and national level, impacting on every area of activity. So not, if you like, in a particular area or silo on its own, but right, making an impact right across the institution. How will we know? This is I'm closing out where I started now. I don't know is the answer, but what we're hoping is, and what, what we are planning, uh, is that the performance framework will inform the ongoing development of the, the National Access Plan. There's, there's a real synergy here between seeing what's happening uh, at the individual institutional level, aggregating that at national level and taking the key elements of that as a basis for the new national access plan. Hence my stressing the importance of um, a strong um, piece uh, around access at the individual compacts. 
Data, uh, data be, has been deviled us over the years. I spent my time on the National Statistics Board and I, I know how difficult it is um, uh, to make progress in this area. But in fairness, I think, collectively in Ireland, data collection has greatly improved. But the duration between policy development, measurement and reassessment, it's too long. We're not getting the data. We need, uh, the, we're not getting it on time and we don't have a system for um, looping it into um, uh, evidence-based policy making. The institutional, regional and system performance reports will give us visibility on the implementation of access measures and that, and that is I suppose at the heart of it and the HEA will mobilise available data sources to measure system performance and access and to advise us on policy development on an ongoing ba basis so it does give us uh, a system um, and quite a strong system, I think, on which to focus on the big questions around access. And it will provide a more accurate and more regular assessment of what we're achieving in this area. What we're not achieving, and most importantly, what needs to be done about it. So that's my contribution, I suppose, very, it's a kind of a pragmatic contribution. But it does seem to me that, um, I think we're all agreed this is a hugely important area, a hugely important priority for government policy. We're all agreed that there's a lot in place and that there has been a lot of progress. And the challenge for us now, over the next, I suppose, three to five years, is to think through in terms of the access challenge. How do we identify the key elements? Who needs to do what at both institutional level and at national level? And how will we know so in five years' time, it'll be very interesting uh, when Mary Liz or, uh, uh, organizes a similar con conference. It'll be very interesting to see the, the nature of the debate and um, you know, what, what our assessment will be collectively about the progress we've made in Ireland on this really important area. So thank you very much.